Great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, welcome everybody to another version of our fantastic chairs lecture seminar series. Um, I am uh, so pleased today to, to introduce um, Kathy Magor. Maybe what I'll actually do is just to start with an acknowledgement. Um, uh, and this is a traditional territorial acknowledgement. So the University of Alberta respectfully acknowledges that we are located on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional gathering place for diverse indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Salto, Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant community. Okay, thank you. So what I'm, it's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, Kathy. As we were just chatting about before we really got populated here, it's been a while since I've seen Kathy speak and some of her work, and I'm really excited to, to hear what she has to talk about today. With just a, a brief introduction, uh, and I'm going to read from some notes that I have here that, that, um, that Kathy was kind enough to, to supply for me. So Kathy, Magor is a professor in biological science at the University of Alberta. Kathy received her BSc in biochemistry in 1986 and a master's in biology in 1989, both from Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia. She also received a PhD in immunogenetics in 1995 from the Medical University of South Carolina. Kathy did postdoctoral fellowships at the University of Hong Kong between 94 and 95, and then Stanford University between 95 and 99. Uh, she, in 1999, she joined the University of Alberta, where she established her research program on immune responses to influenza virus in the natural host, the duck. Her lab explores both innate and adaptive immune genes and their involvement in perpetuation of low pathogenic influenza viruses in ducks and immune protection against highly pathogenic strains. Dr. Magor hopes to learn from the reservoir host ways to mitigate damage from influenza viruses. And so her work is extremely timely. And as I said, I'm looking forward to hearing what, hearing what Kathy has to say today. Kathy has a technician, three grad students, PhD, a number of undergrads in her lab, all funded by CIHR and NSERC, which is absolutely fantastic. And has mentored 25 grad students who continue careers in science and medicine. In 2006, she did a sabbatical with Robert Webster to learn influenza work in their containment labs in Memphis, Tennessee, and did several experiments with bird flu and ducks to examine duck immune responses. Continuing to examine components of the duck immune response from these experiments, and to try to understand why ducks are unharmed by strains of flu that kill everything else. And lastly, Kathy, and as importantly, Kathy is an avid equestrian, trail runner, cross-country skier, backcountry hiker, and the gardener. And so um, just fantastic. Um, I'm excited to, to hear what Kathy has to say. And Kathy, why don't you take it away? I think you have co-host capabilities. Thanks very much, Declan. Thanks for Great. the invitation to talk about our work as well. So this, this is... Um, is that working? Can you see my screen? Can you hear me? <laughs> the, the requisite questions. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so this is me. Uh, this is the earliest photo I have of me. So apparently I always really like ducks. <laughs> I got interested in, in ducks during my PhD where I was working on antibody genes. And this uh, idea that ducks are the reservoir host um, was part of that work. And Robert Webster showed that ducks are the reservoir host of, of flu back in the 60s, and that ducks, all strains of the virus can actually um, be replicated in ducks. And some of those strains get passed to chickens or pigs or to humans. And in some of these other hosts, the virus can become more pathogenic. Um, and, and pandemic strains can emerge from, um, from these other hosts. The strains that replicate in the ducks are typically quite harmless, but if ducks are infected with highly pathogenic strains, they, they are also unharmed by most of these. And so these are really 
two immunology questions. How, how do ducks survive highly pathogenic strains that kill everything else? And what makes ducks permissive to the replication of, of most strains? The story starts with our observation that ducks and chickens um, really differ in their susceptibility to influenza virus. While ducks are the natural reservoir, they're typically unharmed by influenza. Chickens can be um, easily killed by highly pathogenic strains of influenza. For example, H5N1 or bird flu kills chickens in about 18 hours. That flu strain can also kill humans, but it doesn't pass easily between humans. Um, but so humans that get this virus from chickens, um, there's a 60% mortality. And because of that, that this um, H5N1 remains of pandemic uh, concern, of potential pandemic concern. Influenza virus enters through the mucosal layers, so through the epithelial cells of the um, respiratory tract or intestinal tract. And influenza, when it enters those cells, will be detected in mouse and man by a, a detector called RIG-I. And RIG-I detects the five prime triphosphate on RNA strands, little short double-stranded RNA or RNA containing that five prime triphosphate. We, um, if you remember first year biology, switch that out and put a methyl guanosine cap on our RNA strands. So this detector detects the absence of that methyl guanosine cap. So we knew that rig I was the flu detector in, in mouse and man, and that it turns on interferon. And we also knew when they reconstructed the 1918 flu, the most deadly flu ever, um, in Winnipeg, because uh, that's a level four virus, they reconstructed that virus and infected macaques with it. And what you could see is that it shut down this rig I pathway and all the genes downstream. And so we wondered if rig I was involved in the response of birds to uh, influenza. Just a little, um, I'll take you through a simplified version of this pathway. Uh, rig I detects that 5 prime triphosphate RNA, and then Rig I signals through MAVs on the mitochondria, and then initiates a signaling cascade that ultimately results in IRF3 or 7 uh, translocating to the nucleus, where it turns on interferon beta. And interferon beta, in turn, uh, acts on the neighboring cells to turn on interferon stimulated genes. And there are hundreds of interferon stimulated genes that are turned on, many of which we don't know um, what they actually do, but in, in effect, they set up what we call the antiviral state in the neighboring cells, making them very difficult to infect. So we were interested in cloning this gene. Um, Megan Barber in my lab cloned duck rig eye using human primers. And um, at first we thought it was probably human rig eye she cloned, her own, but um, it was only 50% identical to human rig eye. So it was indeed duck rig eye. When we were doing this, we went to a meeting and we heard someone say that chickens are missing rig eye. Well, we hadn't seen rig eye in the, in the genome either, but we assumed it was just not annotated. We didn't think it was actually missing. And so we embarked on a, a three-year project basically to prove that chickens don't have rig eye. And it's extremely difficult to prove a gene is missing. So we did this first by bioinformatics. We could see it wasn't present in the chicken genome or the turkey genome. And more importantly, it wasn't in the transcriptomes. And at that time, the transcriptome for chickens were about 600,000 sequences. And using the same approaches, we could see rig eye in uh, the zebra finch genome, for example, and in the zebra finch um, transcriptome. We also did old fashioned southern blots, and we couldn't see uh, rig eye in chicken DNA. And we also 
could show that the ability to detect that five prime triphosphate RNA ligand was missing in chicken cells. But if we put duct rig eye in those cells, we could actually see um, a reconstitution of that pathway. And so if we put duct rig eye in chicken cells and then challenge those cells with two different strains of highly pathogenic um, avian influenza, H5N1, Vietnam 1203, or um, Hong Kong 213, what we could see is that rig eye protected those cells and decreased the viral titer in those infections by about half. And so we know that rig eye is, is in ducts. We know rig eye is functional and can function. Um, we then wondered if ducts actually use rig eye during an infection. And so at this time I was, this is about the time that I was doing my sabbatical with Rob Webster. And um, I was able to do a series of infections of ducks um, with highly pathogenic strains of flu that I really can't bring into the country. We did infections of ducks with um, a low pathogenic isolate uh, from British Columbia. This was recovered just in routine surveillance in Canada. And this um, strain of flu doesn't harm ducks. And we did a series of infections in level three containment with Vietnam 1203. This was a virus recovered from a fatal human infection. And um, that virus in laboratory experiments can kill everything else. It kills mice, it kills ferrets, it kills chickens in less than a day. But um, it in fact didn't really, it didn't kill my ducks. Um, and, and that was because, although we expected it might, um, and because it can kill ducks, but in making a recombinant version of that virus so that this, it, the experiments would be consistent, we actually made a few mutations that made this virus less um, lethal to ducks. Nonetheless, that virus can still kill everything else. We infected our ducks and then we harvested um, we killed ducks and harvested tissues. We swabbed their trachea and cloaca, and we harvested organs from these ducks. Looking at the swabs, we could see that these infections were very different between these two uh, viruses. VN1203, the highly pathogenic virus, um, replicated primarily in the trachea and the lungs. And we could recover virus from the tracheal swabs, but we never recovered any virus from the cloacal swabs. That virus does spread to other tissues in the, in the duct, including um, spleen and brain, and, and, um, it, and it goes into a systemic infection. BC500, um, the low pathogenic virus, actually, uh, even though we introduced it into the trachea, it sets up infection in the intestinal tract and reaches a very high titer in the, in the cloacal swabs of 10 to the, 10 to the 7 PFU. And so that virus um, becomes more of an, a, an infection in the intestinal tract, and it doesn't spread beyond the epithelial tissues of the intestinal tract and, and um, trachea since we put it in that direction. The, we then took the tissue samples and isolated RNA made cDNA and did a series of qPCR experiments. And what we could see is that um, looking at rig I, for example, in those tissues, rig I is upregulated about 200 fold in VN1203 infected tissues day one post-infection. So very early in the infection and very, very highly upregulated. So ducks are certainly using rig eye um, during these infections. We also saw upregulation of rig eye in the BC500 infected tissues, but to a much lesser extent. And in intestine, we also saw um, upregulation on day one and day three um, in those infected intestine tissues. So ducks certainly are using rig eye during an infection. So ducks, um, and, and that turns on this antiviral program. So influenza virus 
uh, sets up and starts making those viral transcripts, those get detected by rig I. Rig I turns on interferon, and interferon turns on that antiviral program in the neighboring cells. And that results in survival of the ducks and very limited pathology that we could see. Chickens who are missing rig I, those viral um, viruses get, those viral transcripts get made, but they're not being detected by rig I. And the virus um, can reach a much higher titer in a chicken than it ever does in the duck. And there is very little um, interferon being produced and a very weak response and, and much increased pathology. Ducks, or I, I should say chickens, do have another detector that can detect RNA, MDA5, but I would argue that it cannot completely compensate for, um, for the absence of rig eye in chickens, since chickens certainly are not. Um, are not turning on the same uh, antiviral program as, as ducks. So we um, published this work in, in PNAS thanks to our collaborator, Robert Webster. And uh, we were really pretty pleased with this uh, paper in, in PNAS. But I have to say my dad was much more impressed by the story that McLean's uh, did on our work. <laughs> When we did this work, we were asked to provide a cover image and they were gonna make our story the cover story, but we were unable to, to come up with a, a good uh, high resolution picture of a duck. And so the, uh, the, we didn't get the cover story on this, um, on this work. But I mentioned this to my uh, very talented graduate student and uh, to show you that um, students that are that excel in science can also excel in arts. I am uh, going to show you some of her images. These are from Lee Campbell. This is a um, I think it's spectacular pictures of ducks and, I, and I've peppered them throughout my talk just for fun. After that, we had a number of more, a, a few more questions. And these three questions in particular became the focus for the next 10 years of our work, basically. How is rig eye activated? And that's something that we are still working on. Does influenza interfere with the signaling pathway, which um, it certainly does in many ways. And um, we're still working on getting some of that work published. And which um, basically downstream of the signaling what are the genes that are turned on? What are the uh, secret ingredients in this duck's response that, um, that protects the duck? So first I'll talk about how rig eye is activated. And I, and I think this part gets a little complicated, but I'll try to keep it simple. Uh, rig eye is present in the cell in this inactive closed conformation until it engages 5-prime triphosphate RNA the ligand, which opens the rig eye conformation, exposing these card domains. And these card domains then recruit um, trim 25, which ubiquitinates, um, attaches ubiquitin chains to the card domain here. And then that is then activated for and, and able to engage MAVs. In humans, that ubiquitination happens at lysine 172, but in ducks, that residue is not lysine. That, and, and we wondered how duck rig eye gets activated. So using just the card domains and trim 25 in this experiment, we can see that when we add um, trim 25 in increasing amounts, we get activation of rig eye. And when we look at the crystal structure of ducks, um, duck, duck rig eye was, rig eye from ducks was the first one crystallized, um, which was great for us, but um, also uh, for a particular reason that I'll mention later. Humans rig eye, uh, uh, ubiquitinate this lysine, but um, a very near, nearby lysine, which in the crystal structure we could see was very close to um, 
the, the residue that is ubiquitinated in humans, there, this, this lysine is the residue for ubiquitination in ducks. However, if we mutate that residue, Rig I was still active. And we now know that that's because the ubiquitin chains that activate Rig I don't have to be attached. They can just be associated with Rig I. So here I'm showing four units of the Rig I card domains around this fourfold axis. Or if you, if you prefer in this orientation, there are two, two card domains from each Rig I and four of them form a structure in which this folds back on itself to circularize like this. And this is offset by one card domain unit in this lock washer model. And when they, when they were able to crystallize the human rig eye, um, this work was done by Sun Her at Harvard, they had to have attached ubiquitin to get that crystal structure to form where duck rig eye will just associate with uh, ubiquitin at this point. When they saw this structure, she immediately thought that maybe MAVs cat is catalyzed here. And we knew that MAVs had to oligomerize to be functional, but we'd always drawn it sort of side by side. But in fact, this, so she tested this model of how um, MAVs associates by mutating the points between rig I and MAVs or mutating the points between MAVs and the next MAVs so that they couldn't um, form. And she contacted us and to ask if we had um, an avian MAV so that she could do this work. And we, we ended up helping her with this work because she asked us to. And so, MAVS forms these big oligomers, and um, you can actually see that on a native gel, or you can see them on a scanning electron micrograph, where the wild type forms these long um, strands. But if you make mutations so that those um, units cannot interact properly, then, they, then you get this kind of mess. And those mutants are also completely um, the signaling is completely abrogated for those mutants. And so the picture becomes um, really quite simple. Here, uh, rig I, the helicase domain, binds to the RNA strand, and those card domains kind of hang off and form this lock washer structure. And individual units of MAVs associate and oligomerize. You can also overexpress MAVs and get this oligomerization to happen. And it is those filamentous forms of MAVs that actually recruit the troughs and, and initiate the downstream interferon signal. Those monomeric MAVs or the mutant MAVs that we made that could not oligomerize were actually dead for signaling. They um, do not recruit the troughs and there's no signal. And so this is a, a very elegant on off switch for rig eye activation. You have to have this oligomerization in order to recruit the troughs, in order to have this turn on. So how is duck rig, uh, rig eye activated? It's activated by trim 25 and polyubiquitin stabilizes that rig eye tetramer and oligomeric MAVs um, initiates the interferon signal as well. We then ask the question of what genes are turned on by the infection. So not only downstream of this, this pathway, but also by other pattern recognition receptors. I mean, we're just looking at the whole global um, response to infection. And this, was, this work was taken on by Lee Campbell. She was actually doing this transcriptome for a different project, but I convinced her that she should look at these genes, which is not a trivial, uh, not a trivial ask, but uh, she did a, a, beautiful, a beautiful paper.
paper from this work. So we looked at many genes uh, downstream of this RIGI pathway, uh, sort of one by one by qPCR. But Lee convinced me that we should do full transcriptome sequencing, um, RNA-seq on our RNA samples from that original infection that I did while I was on sabbatical. And the RNA quality was still great for many of the samples. And so we um, sent them off and sequenced them completely. And the data is very complicated. And, but there is, um, but it was also very uh, informative. And I think that we will probably go back and look at this data many, many, many uh, times. So first, Lee looked at what genes were upregulated in all infected tissues and came up with a list of 65 genes that were highly upregulated in both high pathogenic avian influenza as well as low pathogenic avian influenza. And these genes are made up of um, lots of pattern recognition receptors. There is uh, both the RIGI pathway and MDA5 pathway are, are strongly upregulated and well represented among the upregulated genes. There's genes in, involved in the interferon signaling pathway. And what I can also say is that many of these genes in any species, we really don't know what they do, but they are strongly turned up by um, infection with influenza. What we also could see is that day one post-infection with the VN1203 was the peak of the immune response. So that's a very rapid innate immune response to infection. While in the intestine, what we could see is that the immune response, um, the peak of immune response was actually day two. And that's probably because it took a, a day for the virus to get from the trachea where we, where we put it in to the intestine where it actually sets up and, and creates a productive infection. Now, among the genes that are um, turned on are a, a huge number of interferon response genes, uh, several of which have known antiviral function. And so here is RIG-I, and these genes are all connected together um, because they, they work and cooperate together. So they're connected together in this string diagram. But I'll only mention a few of them here. Um, Viperin, MX, and IFITM3 which I will come back to um, talking about. We were also interested in the genes that are turned off by infection with influenza. And in particular, those that are turned off by um, either by the virus or by the host, we, we're not sure, but they're turned down in um, the intestine of ducts infected with the low pathogenic viruses. And on day two, there's a, a, a selection of genes that are, that are turned down. All of these genes are involved in um, cytokine signaling. Also complement cascade are, is turned down. And overwhelmingly, it seems like um, this dampens the inflammatory responses to that virus. We're also interested in, so previously we looked at um, genes that were upregulated across all tissues. Now, just as a final sort of look at it, it's like what, what genes are turned up the most in each of these tissues that are involved in replication? So in the VN1203 infection, um, you can see that day one is a, is a very, uh, high upregulation of many, many genes, while BC500 in the intestine shows upregulation of also many, many genes. And if we zoom in on just the top of this, um, top of this picture, what we can see is that the genes are actually different. There's a different set of genes upregulated by each of these um, viruses in the 
their respective replicating tissues. So in the high path flu, VN1203, we see upregulation of interferon and interferon stimulated genes are really top of the list here. Where in the intestine with BC500, it's a completely different set of genes. There's only one gene that was common between both of these in the top 20 hits, and that was MX. And MX is named for it being a influenza restriction factor. So MX for orthomyxovirus. It was a MX is a restriction factor identified in mouse and <clears throat> a known um, antiviral protein that's really important in, uh, against influenza. But more than 30 years ago, uh, in Peter Staley's lab, Ulla Schultz showed that MX is not functional in ducks. And so there, um, you know, that raises sort of our question and, and of course keeps us, reminds us that just because the genes are upregulated doesn't mean that those proteins are actually functional. And what we have to do is actually test them. And so, what do these proteins do? Um, there, there are a number of different proteins that were top of the list from um, the highly pathogenic avian influenza virus, including Rig I, which is turned on. Um, and of course, all of the downstream parts of that pathway are also upregulated. And that makes a, a very strong positive feedback loop that upregulates the genes um, even more. IFIT5 is, is a protein that's made by the bucket load in, a, in, in an influenza infected cell. And in fact, it was actually a marker of infection that was used for probably the last 50 years without anybody really knowing what it does. But IFIT5 actually just seems to sequester RNA and just hold that RNA so that it can't be used for um, template for replication of more strands of the virus. And Viprin um, prevents viral budding, as well as synthesizes a um, chain terminating nucleoside that um, prevents RNA uh, replication. So it's a, it's a chain terminating uh, inhibitor of replication. And Viprin is the most highly upregulated protein um, downstream of, uh, of an infection. Another protein is called IFITM or interferon induced transmembrane protein. It's a little hundred amino acid protein. And that protein sits in the membrane of the endosome and prevents the viral membrane from fusing with the host membrane. So it prevents that membrane fusion that's necessary for the um, nucleic acid that's inside that virus to actually get out um, and, and get into the cell. So we wondered if, if IFITM uh, played a role in, in duck um, protection. Now, um, if you make a knockout mouse, uh, an uh, IFITM knockout mouse is extremely sensitive to even a low pathogenic flu. So it makes a low pathogenic flu look like, a, like, look like a highly pathogenic flu and it's lethal to the mouse. And, and I can say also that mutations in IFITM3 were really important um, and seen among the people that were, uh, that had really adverse or poor outcomes to um, the, the 2009 strain of flu that was pan that a pandemic strain that wasn't really a particularly dangerous strain unless you had um, mutations in that IFITM3. So IFITM3, even just as one of hundreds of these proteins, actually seems to have a really big role in um, the antiviral interferon response of, of um, many animals. And so Graham Blythe in my lab tested this in ducks. He made some stable expressing cells 
uh, either with vector only or with IFITM3. And the cells that had IFITM3 showed half as many infected cells as the um, cells expre expressing just the, or having just the vector only. And it worked equally well against all the strains of flu that we had in the lab, but it didn't, I, I mean, we can't test a highly pathogenic flu, but um, it works well against the low pathogenic strains of flu that we had in the lab. It does not work against a mouse virus, the, vex, the vesicular stomatitis virus. So it's not a universal uh, inhibitor, but very specific inhibitor of viral entry. So what genes are responsible for protection? Um, I can say that the rig I pathway and the interferon stimulated genes are overwhelmingly represented among the genes that are turned on by influenza infection in, in the duck. And we see that they're upregulated in all tissues, all infected tissues. We also see that uh, down regulation of genes in the intestine to prevent uh, inflammation. And um, we can show that many of these interferon stimulated proteins have antiviral functions. And we'll, we'll probably be able to work on that for a long time. <laughs> there are a lot of them. And so come back to the final question I had is, do viruses interfere in this rig eye pathway? And of course they do. This um, pathway targets them, and so they target it. Um, influenza makes a non-structural protein called NS1 that shuts down this pathway at several points by interacting with TRIM25 or rig I. It, it can interact down here in the signaling pathway as well. Influenza also makes another little alternate reading frame um, of the polymerase virus and just a little tiny 100 amino acid protein, which can target MAVs directly and shut down the pathway at this point. And we've looked at a number of these in the, in the duck um, system. SARS uh, can also shut down the rig eye pathway, um, which I don't think you'll be surprised uh, by. And it, it uses the nuclear, nuclear protein, which binds to TRIM25 and, and can also impair uh, signaling. This work, this slide summarizes um, many, many years of work of, of Daniel Evsev, um, PhD student in my lab, to show that uh, if you add the card domains in TRIM25, you get, uh, you get signaling uh, through interferon signaling, but NS1 can shut down that signaling. Um, and, and this is strain dependent. So a mouse, the most adapted virus, PR8, doesn't shut down the signaling, but all of the avian strains that we tested, including BC500 and VN1203, do shut down this pathway in human cells. However, they did not shut down this pathway at all in duck cells or in, in avian cells. So the, um, and, and we, we might've predicted that from the results that, that show that our uh, interferon response is not delayed in ducks. That interferon response happens very, very early on day one post-infection. So to summarize it with a really simple diagram, what we know is that an early interferon response can be protective. And you know that they make, they turn on all those antiviral effectors, many of which have antiviral function, and that can protect uh, against disease. The viral titer doesn't get as high and there's no recruitment of um, cells that are making pro-inflammatory cytokines. However, in the case like 1918 in humans or macaques, um, that interferon response was delayed. In fact, by almost two full days, um, the, at, at least two full days, the, the interferon response gets delayed. 
And that viral titer can get much, much higher and can, and, the, and that viral infection recruits um, all kinds of um, cells that can bring in uh, and, and make pro-inflammatory cytokines resulting in what we call um, sometimes the, the cytokine storm that can cause a, a, a lot of uh, disease. So how do ducks survive with the highly pathogenic strains? Um, what we see is a rapid and systemic interferon response, and especially uh, in the site of replication, so in the lung, uh, which, where highly pathogenic strains replicate, which is unusual for ducks. And so what you don't see is persistence of those highly pathogenic strains in um, populations. They, they uh, come and go or get passed to other species. And what we see is that those antiviral proteins can provide protection. On the other hand, uh, what, what allows perpetuation in this host is that there is a weaker response in the intestine, which is the site of replication of most strains, of all the low pathogenic strains. And we see that active downregulation of, of inflammation. And viruses shut down interferon pathways. And so it's really hard to generalize. So the strains of, of virus that we were working with um, did not shut down the rig eye pathway in the duck. Um, but I would guarantee that there are strains that do, and um, you, you just can't generalize from one viral strain to the next for, for flu. So in the last few minutes, I have, I have a lot of, lot of people to thank. Um, certainly this, this work was initiated by Megan Barber in my lab, and um, Domingo carried out the uh, analysis of, of Trim25 and Rig I. Uh, I talked about Graham's work on IFITM3 and Daniel's uh, work on the, um, the, the shutdown by the viruses. And, and David Tetro dropped everything to do those experiments for, for Sun Her for the um, Rig I signaling work. Probably most of all, I have to thank Jimena because Jimena has been uh, the, the closer on all the projects that have gone on in my lab for the last 10 years or more. And Lee did this very nice transcriptome study as a, as a side project to her actual PhD work, which is to look at the trim proteins in, uh, in birds. And most of all, I, I really have to thank uh, Rob Webster for hosting me in his lab for my sabbatical so that flu viruses used to be a, a line in my grant until I learned to, to work with flu viruses in his lab. And he was kind enough to host us, uh, to host me several times and to host my student, Megan, um, allowing me to, to, to do a lot of experiments with viruses that I can't bring into the country. And I have to thank both uh, CIHR and NSERC for the funding that we've had to do this work. There are many, many people in these pictures and I, and I really owe a lot of thanks to having a lot of great students over the last uh, 20 years. Thanks. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Kathy. That was wonderful. So a big round of applause from everybody. I see it coming in now. <laughs> Um, what I'd like to do is use the reactions. Um, please put your hand up if you have a question. Some may put something in the chat. What's nice about the reactions is that I can see things come in in a timely way and, and, um, and can get them in, in order. Um, but again, thank you so much, Kathy. And um, I know you, you won't mind uh, answering some questions that, that come up. There we go, Tracy. <laughs> that was a great talk, Kathy. I, I was trying to think, and I, this, I, I love this lecture series because I don't think I've ever seen you give a talk. Anyway, so I really enjoyed it. <laughs> Better late than never, right? <laughs> um,
Um, Thanks. I've actually really enjoyed this series too for the same yeah, reason. Yeah. Yeah. It's been really good. Um, so just a couple of questions. So is it, or, or maybe there's more to this, but it seemed kind of surprising that you can just take rig eye from the duck and put it into a chicken cell line and, and the response works. And so are all the other elements around it are, are all conserved and they can interact with that rig eye from the duck? Yes. So I really skipped through that quickly because, uh, <laughs> it, because it gets complicated, but chickens have MDA5, which uses exactly the same, um, it, it, it docks on MAVs in the same way. Um, but MDA5 is really there for recognizing long double-stranded RNA and for things like poliovirus that have that little VPG on the end. Um, okay. And it doesn't, and to some extent, I think in chickens, um, MDA5 does uh, compensate for the lack of rig eye, okay. but not obviously as well as the duck can do it. Okay, interesting. So then my other question is kind of related. Do, do chickens have other sensitivities to other pathogens because of the lack of this component? Yes, all, I, I think that they have a, a certainly more, they're far more sensitive to things like Newcastle disease virus, uh, other, other RNA viruses in particular. Hmm. Cool, interesting, thanks. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, thank you Tracy. Uh, looks like Heather's next. Yep, um, thanks very much, Kathy. That was really interesting. And Tracy took my question because I have chickens and there is, uh, Avian flu is on its way west this season, so <clears throat> there's all sorts of warnings for um, poultry owners to keep their birds isolated from, from other birds. So I came up with another question that is also uh, bird diversity related. When uh, people work with ducks in the laboratory, uh, is it just one particular highly inbred strain or are there different strains of research ducks and do they behave or respond differently to the flu? Well, it, de it depends, yes. Um, th there's many different species of ducks. Um, many uh, of them can be infected with flu, but if you do surveys of wild ducks, um, for example, 30 to 40% of mallard ducks will be infected with low pathogenic strains of flu. And in the same water, uh, Pintail ducks, for example, will be like 1% of them will be infected. So the mallard duck is particularly um, sensitive to flu and, and is the reservoir host of flu. In the lab, we do a lot of experiments with um, derivatives of mallard ducks. So domesticated mallard ducks, uh, the, which are all Anis platyrhynchus, but um, the Pekin duck that is farmed for uh, food and, and is a huge uh, source of meat in China is the, the main duck that we, uh, we, have the trans we have the genome from and we did our transcriptome from that, um, from those. I did those infections in Pekin ducks, which are uh, domesticated mallard ducks. Yeah, so has anyone compared amongst, I'm sure there's not just one breeder of lab ducks in the world. I'm just wondering whether there's variation in the laboratory strains themselves that might influence uh, outcomes among different testing research laboratories. So I, yeah, I thought that there might be polymorphism of rig eye in the wild, in wild ducks, as well as in um, different farm ducks, but, but there isn't. So the sequence that we, put in the database is identical to the sequence from a, a Chinese group. Um, so I, I really haven't pursued that <laughs> to see oh, if, it, oh. if they really, if there really is, there really are differences. There might be. So, yeah, so really conserved. That's very interesting. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Great, Thanks. thank you, Heather. Uh, Brad. Yeah, <laughs> something I hadn't noticed before. Um, you, you said that there was no, uh, Cloacal viruses when you uh, infected with the highly pathogenic Vietnam. Do you know if that's the case for other highly pathogenic, but they're also lung, and whether or not that has probably 
spared us more outbreaks of highly pathogenic um, things because there's not shedding into water where it could get into other species? I, I, I wouldn't hazard, I would hesitate to say there's any generalizations with flu, okay. but um, certainly out that strain of flu replicated primarily in the um, lung and the other highly pathogenic strains uh, replicate primarily in the lungs, but they go systemic. And so you can find replication happening in many tissues of the, of the ducts. And so although our cloacal swabs were negative with this virus for three days that we tested, um, I would be careful to not say that, the, that we wouldn't see um, some replication in the intestine since it's so permissive for every other strain. But yes, I think that, that that's a good point that the, highly, the high pathogenic viruses, the ducks mount a hell of a response to those. And so they don't persist in nature. So you'll see an outbreak and then it is gone the, the following year. You don't see those strains continue and get circulated the way the low pathogenic strains just seem to go from one animal to the next or from one, one duck to the next. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Brad. Uh, and so I actually wanted to sneak in here <laughs> for a little bit, Kathy. So um, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I understand this properly, but I was wondering, are there different versions of rig I? Like I, I, I would, I had thought that or imagined that having different versions or the ability to identify a wide range of, of, um, uh, of targets might be advantageous for the organism. So as far as I can see, and, and as far as we know, I'd say no. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, I thought that gene might be polymorphic, but mm -hmm. it doesn't seem to be. Um, there are different versions between different species. And you can see um, that that gene is under, under selection, um, probably because it's targeted by viruses. Um, and so you do see differences in the, in the gene, as, I, as you could see, like mm -hmm. many of our biochemical genes are 95% similar between birds and, and humans, but this gene is 54% similar between humans and birds. So that, that tells me that it's evolving. Right, okay. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, Olaf. <clears throat> yeah, I have a I have a quick question regarding the rescue. So you could rescue the chickens basically with the rig eye from the ducks, right? And the ducks are more resistant than humans. So do you think we could rescue humans with the rig eye or is the different susceptibility there different? So, so we have rig eye um, and we use rig eye but the virus, as I said, can target that pathway and shut down our interferon pathway for at least a couple of days. And that gives the virus an opportunity to, to um, and people that, that uh, succumb to this kind of respiratory infection, it's often very, very early in the infection that they just are overwhelmed by the virus and by the recruitment of um, all of the, leukocytes to the lung and making this pro-inflammatory cytokine storm. If we, I, I would say that um, some ways to think about treatments might be uh, treating with interferon early, but again, that has to be, so if people, we spread flu because we go out and about for two days without realizing that we're sick. As, as soon as the interferon, um, it's the interferon that really makes you feel like crap when you're sick. And as soon as you start to feel like crap, you're no longer spreading that virus around. And so the, the virus has, um, has, a, has the way to actually prevent you from knowing you're sick for those first early couple of days. But the duck, the duck rig eye is not targeted or is not suppressed or... By the, uh, by the strains that we tested, 
I can say that the virus is not um, shutting down that rig eye pathway. I believe there will be a, a strains that will shut down the duct rig eye pathway because it is evolving in that host. Thank you. Okay, great. I, I don't see any more hands and there's nothing in the chat at the moment. Um, I, Brad's hand is up, but I, I suspect that's a, a slightly older one. Okay, well, if there aren't any more questions, uh, can you please join me in, in thanking Kathy for a wonderful talk this afternoon? So, yeah, you know, like, like Tracy, it was a, a pleasure to, to, to see it because it's, and I was thinking back to, I think I may have seen one talk a long time ago. So it was, it was a joy to, to, see, to see your research, Kathy. Thank you again. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the invitation. And I agree, this, this series is a lot of fun. That's great. Okay, thank you, everybody, and have a wonderful evening. Thanks for coming, everyone. It's too bad we can't have a beer now. <laughs> <laughs> I know, that would be... I mean, we can, but... Perfect. <laughs> that would be perfect. Yeah. yeah thanks a lot, thanks Declan. Again. Yeah, thanks again, Kathy. And uh, I'll, I'll be in touch as, as things proceed. But thank you so much. That's, that's great. Nice to see Take you, care. Andy. Thanks for coming. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.